Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by thanking the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Mr. Miroslav Lajcik, for the invitation to moderate the panel on contribution of the water decade to the implementation of water-related SDGs, addressing challenges and seizing uh, opportunities through uh, strengthening uh, cooperation and partnerships. I now invite our fifth speaker, uh, Mr. Sadhguru, a yogi, mystic, and visionary, uh, to deliver his remarks. Mr. Sadhguru is one of uh, India's 50 most influential people established Isha Foundation, a non-profit volunteer-run organization operating worldwide. Mr. Sadhguru has initiated several projects for social revit uh, revitalization, education, and uh, environment through which millions of people have been given the means to overcome poverty, improve their quality of life, and achieve community-based sustainable development. In the fall of 2017, Mr. Sadhguru initiated Rally for Rivers, a nationwide campaign aiming, aiming uh, to implement sustainable and long-term policy changes to revitalize India's severely depleted rivers, which found great support among India's leadership and the people. You have the floor, Mr. Sadhguru, please. Good afternoon, everybody. The first and foremost is uh, to make everybody on this planet to understand that water is not a commodity, it's the life-making material. The stuff we are made of, over two-thirds of the planet is water, two-thirds of our bodies water. But where is the water gone? Actually, water is not gone anywhere. Whatever water we had on this planet a million years ago, we still have the same amount, it's not gone out of the atmospheric space, but it's just not where we need it. We are not able to service the people with the needed water. And what are the reasons? Why is it happening to us like this? I would uh, limit myself to the situation in India. And in many ways, this situation is relevant to all tropical regions of this planet. India has been always referred to as land of seven rivers, but we have over seven hundred rivers. It's a very richly waned land in terms of rivers. But in the last fifty years, the depletion of rivers on an average has been nearly sixty percent of depletion of water has happened in the rivers. Why is this so? What are the causes? There are many things to do, but fundamentally we must understand there are two types of rivers, glacier-fed rivers and forest-fed rivers. In India, only four percent of the river water is glacier-fed. Rest, fortunately, is forest-fed. In the rest of the world, seventy-two percent of the rivers are forest-fed. So that is also a fortune. Why I'm saying it's fortunate is because we can put back the forest, we can put back the vegetation, but we cannot just bring down snow whenever we feel like it. It's important that we need to understand, like a country like India, we have an average of forty-five to fifty days of rain or precipitation. What comes down in forty-five days, we are required to hold it in the land for three hundred and sixty-five days. If this has to happen, it doesn't matter who says what and thousand different opinions, but fundamentally you can hold the water in the land only if the soil has the necessary organic content and there is vegetation. Generally, it is understood that to call soil as soil a minimum of 
two percent organic content should be there. But today, nearly twenty-five percent of India, the organic content is point zero five percent. That means we are converting rich soil into sands. That means desertification is happening at a rapid pace. I am not an environmentalist, I am not a scientist, nor am I a policy maker. But my engagement with life around me has been from a very early childhood. My involvement with forests, mountains and rivers has been very active right through my life. And with great concern I've been watching, particularly in the last twenty-five years, how the rivers that I have known since my childhood, how they have depleted. Particularly in the last seven years, the depletion is so sharp and alarming that we invested a certain amount of time and effort and energies to study these things and see how to revive this and made a policy document, a recommendation, policy recommendation, 760-page recommendation to the federal government in India. It is heartening to see that there is a, a broad understanding about this in state governments and in the central government. When we presented the policy document to the Prime Minister at 6.15 in the evening, last October 2nd, next day morning, 11.30, we got a call from the Prime Minister's office saying that they want a soft copy because Prime Minister has formed a special group to look into the policy. So obviously, the enormity and the urgency of what needs to be done is definitely gotten into the minds of policy makers in... at least in India. I'm sure it is on because with the concern with which everybody is speaking from various nations, this urgency and enormity of the situation has sunk into all of us. So we know what is the problem. We generally know what is the solution. It may be a little more specific to each nation and each geographical location, but generally we know what is the solution. Now the problem is implementation, the problem is getting everybody's cooperation, the problem is the size of the solution. <laughs> How do we put it on the ground? This is a big problem. So one thing is definitely every nation in collaboration should form because ecology is not something that respects national or political boundaries. Rivers don't have boundaries, whether of states or nations. So to be able to form a, an international policy, maybe region-wise, tropical region and subtropical regions and temperate climates like this we could make, but a comprehensive policy that everybody will agree to and start implementing because a time has come that in the next... It's, it's really a fantastic day today that we are talking about a decade of action, not decade of talk talking, a decade of action which is a very good terminology and very good intention. Now we have to get into action. Obviously, United Nations does not have geographical presence. It is the nations on the ground which need to act. So whatever the advisory is, whatever the decisions made, must become policies in every nation. There are a variety of situations in this which are culturally uh, linked, and we have to be sensitive to this, otherwise it won't work on the ground. So one thing we're doing in India is, one simple solution we offered is, in the riverine land in India, twenty-five to twenty-seven percent is still owned by the government. So we are talking about all the government-owned lands except for allocations for next fifty years of development, except for that. Everything else must be converted into forests. The remaining nearly seventy percent of the land is farmland. You cannot ask a poor farmer who is fighting for his survival to save the river or ecology or the world. So we have an economic plan with significant ecological impact that is a minimum of one kilometer on either side of the river should become tree-based agriculture. We have in small models proven that by moving from crop-based agriculture to tree-based agriculture, the farmer's income can go up anywhere between three to eight times. And 
this is an economic plan, but significant ecological impact will happen. There are encroachments, there are sand minings, and there are various other things. For all these things, we have a policy recommendation. These recommendations are very implementable and practical, which is relevant to every tropical nation, as I said earlier. But the important thing is we need to understand these are the two types of rivers we have, forest-fed and glacier-fed. Glacier-fed rivers, we just have to look up and pray <laughs> that something right happens. But forest-fed rivers, we can revive. Fortunately, it's more than seventy percent of the world's rivers and over ninety percent of Indian rivers are forest-fed. So, getting them back is not such a big challenge if there is a committed approach to this. Maybe we will not be able to put back forests, but we can definitely put back tree cover in the form of tree-based agriculture. For example, India is right now importing nearly seven billion dollars worth of timber. So we are trying to get a policy across that there was a, a colonial policy that if you cut a tree on your land, you can't transport it, you, you need permission to do it. We are trying to take away these old rules so that people will be encouraged to plant forest trees on their land because it will be an economic uh, proposition. Without making ecology, without marrying ecology and economy, there is really no solution because if there is no economic benefit, getting the masses involved is not going to happen. A dynamic policy is needed, but very important thing is a mass involvement of people. Without people's participation, this is not going to happen, and people's participation will not come unless there is economic benefit attached to it. So talking about saving the world, we can give any number of lectures, it won't work. The reason why India responded the way it responded to Rally for Rivers, because it was an economic plan. 162 million people participated in a one-month-long rally across the country. Probably this is the largest ever for any ecological movement because ecology means it is a concern of a handful of people who are worried about the future, we are worried about the present, that is the attitude. If you want to describe these two dimensions, people understand economy as today's issue, ecology as next generation's issue. No, ecology is this generation's issue. This has to be made an urgent possibility and whatever we do, unless we make ecology into a, a lucrative process for the large number of people involved in it, large masses of people will never involve themselves in making this happen. When we look at the water depletion that's happened, just to, I mean, we live in southern India and the kind of depletion happened, today it's in news that uh, Bengaluru city, which is known as Bangalore in the rest of the world, when, when I was a child, there were over thousand and twenty ponds and lakes in Bangalore city and three perennial rivers. I'm talking about perennial water bodies. Today, there is no trace of these rivers. We don't even know where they are anymore. Everything is built upon. And only eighty-two lakes and ponds existing. Out of this, forty-four of them are just sewage water. Only about thirty-six to thirty-seven perennial water bodies have actual water, rest is all sewage. This has happened in forty years' time. This is what we are doing. This is the pressure of population. Human footprint has become so broad that there is no room for anything else to happen on this planet. We have to understand when we say life, we are not talking about just us, but every other life because if insects, worms, birds, animals and trees disappear, this pl planet cannot exist, there will be no life on this planet. But if you and me disappear, the planet will flourish wonderfully well. So we need to understand that in the scale of significance, their significance on this planet is far more than us, though we may be a dominant force right now. We are a recent happening, we may also have a very near ending if we don't handle ourselves right. This is not that planet is in peril. Planet is not in peril. It is only human life.
which is in peril. Planet will recover. If we disappear, if all of us go to sleep for twenty-five years, everything will be back and everything will be wonderful. So we are also wonderful, but we're just little too many. <laughs> we need to understand this. In 2000, <laughs> at the beginning of twentieth century, we were just 1.4 billion people. Today we are 7.3 billion people. In 2050, United Nations is projecting we could be 9.6 billion people. Why are we making predictions like astrologers? Why don't we have a plan by 2050 what population we want to have? Because this planet can only sustain that many. But we don't have a plan, we are going on making predictions. It's time this, a decade of action, must seriously consider population because that is the big elephant in the room. We don't have an ecological crisis, we have a population crisis. We're just too many people. If we don't plan for a sensible population in the future, if we do not consciously bring it to some kind of solution, Nature will do it in a very cruel way, that's all you're seeing. What you're seeing is water crisis is nature's way of controlling our population and this could become very severe and from what I see, India and some of the African nations will take the first beating on the way. They will get the first beating. In fact, the most severe impact will be on India and African nations. So, this is a a very deep concern, this is not like I'm trying to paint a, a doomsday picture, but if we go on business as usual, we are getting there, there's no question about it. And as we have seen in India, many villages are completely empty now, people have moved away from the village because there's no water anywhere. Whole villages are gone. So this essentially means as water crisis progresses, more and more people will try to migrate to the city. If too many people migrate to the city where there is necessary infrastructure is missing, we will… we are looking at a very severe civil strife. We really fear what kind of civil strife can happen in the next twenty to twenty-five years in a country like India unless we take corrective action today. And I am glad today we are starting a decade of action. As I said, fortunately our rivers and water bodies are largely forest fed. That means we can put back the vegetation and revive these water bodies quite effortlessly. We have seen and demonstrated this happening, but now we are looking at large-scale demonstrations in some of the states in collaboration with the state governments. Many states are going into a, a huge plantation drives like never thought of before. They're talking about tens of millions of trees being put on the riverbanks and in the catchment areas. This is the only way you can take care of river-fed, I mean forest-fed rivers. Ice-fed rivers, glacier-fed rivers are a different matter. That is not going to change just like that. That has to go through a whole lot of process. Above all, today I would like to appeal to every one of you, as I said, if not an entire globe, at least region-wise, cooperation and common policies are a must for the future well-being of generations to come. Thank you very much. I thank Mr. Sadhguru for his very interesting remarks. There is no doubt that your great experience and initiatives will raise awareness across the world regarding deteriorating conditions of rivers and encourage people to take actions. Your remarks have certainly enriched our discussions. Excellencies, dear participants, I now open the floor for comments and questions. First, one of… Uh, on my list is uh, Mr. Peter Ng. Chief Executive of, of Public Utilities Board, head of the Singapore National Water Agency. Please, the floor is yours. Excellencies, do you agree with me that portable reuse should be made a priority for the world 
if we are serious about achieving SDG 6. And if you do, then surely the UN has to play a leading role in this. It has to become an advocate for the endless reuse of water. And it has to deploy its influence to encourage and to persuade member countries to adopt the portable reuse of water. As Singapore has considerable experience and expertise in this area, we stand ready to advise and to help. Thank you. Uh, I thank uh, Mr. Peter Ng, uh, the distinguished uh, participants. The floor for comments and uh, questions is open. Please, if you want to make any comments, uh, please press your microphones. Excuse me. Can I say something? Uh, <coughs> Recycling uh, and reusing water is no more an optional thing. It's something that we have to do because of concentrated populations in cities. But one most important thing which uh, generally not been addressed in most nations is, as we know, over seventy percent of water consumption is agriculture. In India, it is eighty-four percent is agriculture. Shifting from flood irrigation to micro-irrigation would make a huge difference. But micro-irrigation has its problems when land holdings are very small. So aggregating the irrigation process is an important part of this. Only if we do that, water consumption could come down in a way that it's significant and noticeable. Reuse of city water, whatever domestic water we use, is definitely has to be done, there's no question about that. But uh, micro-irrigation, moving into micro-irrigation, aggregating irrigation process is a very important step that nations need to take. Mr. Sadhguru, please. The floor is yours. It's uh, truly commendable that uh, we've heard that the Prime Minister of uh, Singapore consumes recycled water to make the point how safe it is. That's wonderful. But that level of purification, there are economic issues for countries like India and many other nations. So what we are looking at is our daily sewage volume in the top 200 cities and towns in India amounts to 36 billion liters per day. This can easily irrigate anywhere between three to nine million hectares of land with micro-irrigation. And we've always found when we bring micro-irrigation, naturally women get into the act because <laughs> micro-irrigation needs a certain level of patience and generally we find men want to rip it off because it doesn't work. It's the women who have the patience to go to every uh, <laughs> point and fix it. So naturally their role in agriculture and fruit production would be greatly, greatly enhanced. If we move into micro-irrigation and we can bring down the water consumption in agricultural sector by at least forty percent, this we have demonstrated in many places, at least by forty percent, and uh, that would be the level of recycling we need. We don't have to necessarily recycle it to a point for human consumption, but for agriculture, it's much easier to do it, and economically, it's more uh, relevant to us. 